and thank you all for joining us today for this educational InnoVise webinar. My name is Caitlin Nyan and I'm part of the marketing team here in the InnoVise Portland office. In this webinar, we'll, talk about, we'll take a look in detail on how to properly size, locate, and select outlet systems for a storm water detention pond, including the incorporation of water quality volume retention, accommodating larger protection event storms, and, and report the final design in a way that makes sense. For those of you who may not be familiar with Innovice, we have a long history of providing high-performing, innovative software solutions. Our intention is to make sure that in your work, you can design, model, review, and manage with confidence. This also means that we strive to provide excellent customer service and support, and that we offer continuing education opportunities like these for engineers and others in our industry. Innovise offers a library of software programs for the design, analysis, and management of infrastructure, including powerful storm and flood modeling software like XP Drainage, which you will see today. Now, on with our presentation. I'd like to introduce our presenter. Today's presenter is Zach Sample, our storm water products manager. He has over 10 years of civil engineering experience in site design, storm water planning, and hydraulic analysis. Zach has performed a number of advanced water resource studies, including hydraulic and water quality system assessments, as well as 1D and 2D hydraulic river and floodplain studies. During his time with XP, XP Solutions and Innovise, Zach has helped hundreds of clients with their models, conducted training courses, and led the development of our stormwater design software, XP Drainage. Thank you again for joining us. Would you like to start a discussion, Zach? I sure would. Thanks, Caitlin. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. We're talking about ponds. So a little bit of how to design from more of the kind of introductory overview, um, I guess, take on this subject. So we'll start with just the basics of what ponds are and go into just really briefly typical pond design requirements and pretty common sizing practices. And, and then pretty quickly jump right into actually working through this um, with a tool. We'll happen to be using XP Drainage, but I feel like that's really where a lot of the engineers I've spoken with over the last number of months really want more and more just hands-on time, um, you know, turning the knobs, so to speak, on dialing a pond in to be exactly right for them. So what? What is a pond? Uh, I feel like everyone, especially if you have a four-year engineering degree, you're going to know what a pond is. But just to kind of start from the basics, right, the, in the stormwater world and what we're trying to do, so thinking about working on some sort of development project, we're changing infrastructure, and we're ultimately changing the ecosystem of that site. Well, part of that change might make things worse. We might make things more impactful than they used to be. So that is usually when it comes to runoff and stormwater, the reason we have a pond. So that pond facility is gonna be designed to either hold, that's retain, you'll see the word retain used, or to slow, that would be detain, um, runoff flows from a developed site or a development site in order to preserve that natural hydrologic cycle. You can't really I'll see at the moment, I'm using air quotes when I say the natural hydrologic cycle. Uh, depending on what side of the public-private, um, I guess, offices you're sitting in, you know, with the municipalities ultimately being the stewards of our communities um, and really trying to keep the ecosystem you know, as it used to be or as it is with, you know, development groups, private firms trying to implement change, which inherently is going to bring along you know, potentially negative items when we're ultimately paving more area than we used to. This idea of a natural hydrologic cycle is a, is a bit of a, I don't know, a whole topic we, we, could, uh, we could discuss here in a webinar in, a, in and of itself. So sometimes I'm physically located in Portland, Oregon. We talk about maybe there is like a Lewis and Clark uh, um, hydrology system, right? So that's, you know, before anyone came and began to pave. Sometimes it is just simply there's a site, let's say, um, in other parts of the country where it is already partially developed. So your existing conditions, right, that's the kind of the baseline for your site, is already partially paved, partially developed. So 
ultimately you were using a pond to preserve quote unquote natural hydraulic cycle, basically whatever is deemed as the existing site. Now these facilities, as one can imagine, is they're extremely common. And this kind of really was, I would call it the kind of the traditional um, design option when it comes to stormwater um, attenuation. So especially back 60s, 70s, 80s here in the US, yes, let's put a pond downstream up a site. Now we found that there's, well, that actually doesn't really give us all of the benefits that we thought. It actually does pretty significantly impact our downstream water bodies. In particular, stream erosion is really common with detention facilities because you're increasing the low flow frequencies, so on and so forth. But today, we're just gonna look at what I'd call the bread and butter design uh, from a number of years ago is just drain all the water down to a pond. This is still used quite commonly, though this has begun to evolve quite a bit. I talked about this in my last webinar about how green infrastructure and really alternative holistic dispersed drainage systems are being used uh, and being required across the country. I'm showing more than just ponds in this picture. So there's really two items which make up a pond in my mind. And, and really I think most engineers, stormwater designers in particular, when someone says a pond, they really immediately think of that there's two things. Well, there's, there's a physical volume which can hold stormwater. That's literally like maybe the pond, you might call that. Well, there's also the outlet structure associated with that facility. And they are just locked um, at the hip there, so to speak. So you really need to have both on your site. So we'll look at designing both of those items today. Now, I can't show every single type of design requirements that exist all across the US, though the vast majority follow this. The principle that I'll kind of point to here is, you know, no more than you used to. Uh, so you can't discharge more water at either more, more volume or perhaps just simply more flow rate than it than the site did before you developed. Again, if you're trying to roll back a site which is partially developed back to complete pre-developed conditions, well, you might be having a little more of a heavier lift than perhaps a site where you can you know, assume a partially developed existing conditions. Basically, whatever that existing site is established to be, we need to look at perhaps volume, more commonly it's just flow. So we need to look at um, reducing the peak flow to pre-developed conditions. And usually, the usual suspects here, the two through 100 year rainfall events. That looks like the second bullet there. Uh, this is important. So the two through 100 year rainfall events are really more of like the protection events. Maybe that's often the terminology used. So there's these higher flow events um, channel protection, flood protection. So these are two through 100 year protection events. There's also a water quality item, which is really across the US mandated now. So we need to design not only for these very large events, but also specifically for a water quality, um, I might call it a runoff reduction event or a first flush event. Those three terms are used all across the US. So in this case, um, I'm gonna assume that the water quality event is 0.8 inches of rain, all right? So if I was in Houston, it might be uh, you know, something much higher, right? Um, I know if I was, let's say, on the coast, um, out in the Carolinas, 1.2 perhaps. Um, so we're gonna go with 0.8. Again, if you use something slightly different, okay? Really common, just for this example, I'm trying to pick just one set of requirements to follow through. So 0.8 inches will be our water quality event. So that's the flow that we're gonna really look at reducing and holding on to. And then we get into some really practical uh, requirements. So dimensions. So in this case, every single um, city or county is different, but in this case, we're gonna say the pond can't be more than five feet deep with, and it needs a six inch freeboard, okay? Now there's also one other item is we can't have more, we can't have a, a, the side slopes, the batter of our facility, any steeper than a one to three slope. 
Okay, I talk about this pretty commonly, but for anyone who's ever, um, I guess, looked at maintenance plans or looked at a site once it's developed, you need to usually be able to mow these facilities, right, and do landscaping maintenance you know, easily and readily. So that's why it's hard to drive something on a greater slope than one to three. So that's really the maximum that we're gonna have. We're gonna need to have an outlet structure, as I mentioned before, and we're gonna focus on having a low flow orifice and a high flow weir. Now this could look like a million different things. Um, you could just have a plastic pipe sticking up in the air, right? And an open top to that pipe and a hole in the side of it. Okay, well that hole in the side would be your orifice, the top of that pipe, well, that's really just a weir, um, and not, not to get you know too technical, right? But that's really just a weir with the weir width is just equal to the circumference of that facility or that, that pipe, okay? So, or in, in other cases, you might actually have more of a box structure where you have a hole in the side and, and actually just on one face, a weir notch cut out, ultimately, we're gonna look at those two items um, to control our outflow. And lastly, you know, there are some kind of additional constraints. So a couple items which are pretty common. So there's really, the, in my mind, there's like the hard requirements and I guess depending on where you're at, depending on your, your relationships with the city and the client, there might be kind of these soft requirements and constraints. So we might know that we have moderately poor soils. So let's say we have there is some ability to infiltrate on this site, but it's pretty small, 0.2 inches an hour. Let's still take that into account because everything will help. Another thing is, you know, there's no, I'd call them boundary conditions. If anyone's familiar with this, um, you know, this would be if you have maybe the very outlet, uh, the pond on your site, maybe there's a stream or another larger water body that it connects into. That might be dominant, right? That, if there's a flood in a larger river, well, that might back onto your site. So sometimes you really need to take into account so these boundary conditions and how they might back in or influence your site. We don't have any, I'll, I'll point to how you can easily apply those, but we don't have any we need to take into account. Also, this is kind of contradictory, but so we have, let's say a client that wants as small a pond footprint as possible to get as many um, lots and I guess, you know, um, walking paths and whatnot um, on the site, though they don't want a one to three slope on some of the spots on the site. They want more of a one, one to four batter. Okay, well, let's see how that works. So we'll start with a one to four. I'm kind of tipping my hand here a little bit, but if that doesn't work, the backup could be to make it steeper. Okay. Now let's look at one thing here real quick. So just as an example, I want to show, if I can show this on my screen here. So those were requirements that I kind of pulled out um, really from the top of my head to be representative across the country. Here's Minnesota Stormwater Manual. And this is a great document, a great resource. And you can see uh, that I could jump down through this document and there are all types. There's water quality volume. Uh, we get into how it should drain, how valves should work, setbacks. There's a huge set of requirements that go into designing ponds. So I just want to point that out. Most of you attending might be familiar with this, but wherever you're located, wherever your project is, go in and even just for a pond, there might be 20 pages on exactly how to maintain it, exactly how you need to document the handoff to the county, so on, for, so, on so forth, okay? So there really is a lot that, that you need to document uh, and goes into setting up these constraints. So a lot of little boxes to check and to be aware of. So the sizing process, now again, this is not the exact way every single group in the US is gonna work, though this is gonna be the vast majority of counties and firms and engineers are going to use this identical approach. You might maybe have projects where you don't need to look at water quality. Well, great. Then that, that is obviously one step you could skip. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at initial, I'm going to call it smart volume sizing. 
So we're gonna, you know, we're gonna get a good starting point for our site. So we'll start with water quality event. You can see I have the formula over there. There's a number of different formulas for water quality or runoff reduction. We're gonna start with calculation for volume to represent kind of what a first flush storage should be. Then we need to look at sizing up to the 100 year event. That's obviously gonna be the controlling large event for our site. Then get into initial outlet sizing. We'll see here's an example of that outlet. If it's kind of a box facility as opposed to a pipe sticking up in the air, well, we might just have a weir opening and one face of that. Um, there's as many different types of outlets as there are ponds. So uh, we're gonna look at just one orifice and uh, for the five-year event and one weir, okay? So we'll look at minor flow and high flow. So that's gonna set, again, you see the words initial there. We're gonna have initial volume and initial sizing. No matter how smart or a, a good of a guess on those two, those are still typically assessed and calculated using kind of static, maybe the rational method, maybe a simple water quality volume um, calculation. The dynamic assessment is where we, where we run a full hydraulic analysis of the site. That is you know, absolutely paramount to being realistic in what we're putting forward, right? So even I might even go so far as to say that I might be negligent as an engineer in some cases if I don't, okay? So if I have a client and I just design all the pipe network using the rational method, that's a, that's a very simple hand calculation approach to runoff, that might ultimately give me pipe sizes which are an order of magnitude larger than I need. So I've seen that all over the US, all the groups I've worked with. They have a pipe network which has been designed using the rational method only for the five year event. Yet the 100 year event can actually run through that system because it's so over designed. So really you're costing your, your client a lot of extra money there. So we've got to use a dynamic assessment. You know, and ultimately, I guess, you know, what's the point of all of this? The point is that this isn't a dead end. We're doing this work and we get this back out. So whatever work we do, we find out the right answer. We find the right values for our results. We find the right size and dimensions of our facility. We need to push that out into reports, into CAD, so on and so forth. So let's jump right into the model. Okay, so I just, I'm, I'm trying to take a moment to glance over at questions. I'll try to do this as I move along. That's a lot of uh, ball to juggle on the air at once. So there's a question about kind of what are the preset, well, I'm gonna call them templates. I'll cover this. Uh, I'll jump back to a question if I don't fully address it. Um, at the end. So we'll look at as kind of organically as I move through this, the idea that there are preloaded underground tanks and swales and bioretention and, and land uses, so on and so forth. Okay, so there are, and, and you'll see me use these as we go. So this happens to be, I guess, the starting point of a pond design on a site. We'll see, we're looking, we're using a tool XP drainage. And if anyone here has used CAD, or a Windows computer. Um, this is gonna be pretty self-explanatory. There's a ribbon on the top, you work left to right and you finish your project. Kind of as easy as that. If you have information from either CAD, that's, that's uh, MicroStation or Civil 3D, uh, import that, import pipe networks. Or if you have GIS, um, a lot more municipalities use GIS, great. Start up a model, start up an assessment using GIS. We have some preliminary sizing, we can build up a network, ultimately look at results and export, okay? Anything here in this interface, one could imagine I right click and you can interact with it. Import, export, load. So the site we have here, I'll just look at a flow path. And here's our site. So I happen to have water draining through this network. and Ultimately it drops out on this downstream end, and we need to mitigate this. So in fact, what I'll do to start, 
I'll actually turn this off, exclude from analysis. I have a couple other items I was playing with here, but the green, these are phases. These are different, really just sites. So here I have the same site, but with the existing conditions, land use. This is a template that I had. We'll see 15% impervious. This is really kind of a green field to start with, okay? Only a couple of the catchments had some, some infrastructure which was already existing. So we have an existing site and we have kind of what we're gonna start with. So here's our pipe network as I had just shown without any mitigation. So I could run a full analysis and I'm gonna run a whole range of rainfall events and we'll look at a comparison of kind of what the existing site shows for off and then what this developed really unmitigated looks like. And you're gonna see that we're gonna have a huge uh, impact. We're gonna have a huge increase in the uh, the, the runoff as one would imagine. We've paved a bunch of the site, built homes, put roads in, well, we're gonna have a lot higher runoff. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm looking at a whole range of rainfall events. I'm gonna jump over to the results. I only wanna look at one item at the moment. This is a, a phase report, I might call it. So we're gonna look at existing and developed phases. We're gonna compare these two. This is just a table. I could add charts, we'll look at that more later. I just wanna see, you can see from this list here, existing and developed, and actually I ran all these rainfall events. I actually only wanted to run just a couple of them. So we'll just look at the, you know, the water quality event. That's a dynamic simulation, okay? This is actually a one inch of rain, just, just for an example's sake. So we have very small flows at first, well, about, a cubic foot per second coming off our site. Okay, we get to the five-year event. We'll see in the existing site, it's about 2.1. Well, we have almost seven, or I guess 6.7 cubic feet per second coming off. The 100-year event, all right, 7.1, 7.12. In the existing, we have almost 13 CFS. So we clearly need to knock down quite a bit of flow. So that's where we'll begin. So I'll actually jump back to, I want to I want to keep the unmitigated site just to show. And you see this include in analysis. When I run the full analysis, it will include this phase as it runs through. So what's the first thing we could do? This is something that maybe should have been done before we even started, but we call it deluge. I happen to have, as you can see, a background image, a CAD file. I also happen to have a surface that's loaded, pretty useful. And now I just ran, it just took, literally a moment to show um, a 2D on-grid rainfall analysis. This is a super simplified way, taking two inches of rain and putting it on the surface and just seeing where it goes to, okay? This is great for just kind of a planning level assessment to see where water goes. And on this site, sure enough, really everything naturally drains down to the Southwest, okay? Well, that makes sense, we're, we're draining all this flow, and now we just need to put a pond on the site. But deluge is something fun. I like to use that to, to make sure my catchments are delineated correctly. Okay, so let's add a pond. Now something that I'm gonna call out, that it's a, a, a limitation, I'll say. I was gonna say problem, but it's a limitation when using something like CAD, okay? So um, let's just say Civil 3D. Um, I think the same thing for MicroStation. But usually those tools, they share stormwater items um, in a, kind of a limited way. So they'll, they'll use a land XML file and you can push that, you know, within that tool or across to platforms like XP Drainage. Problem with that is it really only stores manholes and pipes. So what we need to do is we need to add in a pond, okay? That doesn't really exist when it comes to land XML files. Well, that's something we need, right? So here would be an excellent example. This came from a CAD file, land XML, and here's the pond. It just says no, this point down here. Because that's all that, let's say, CAD could do. That's all that it knew what to do with this kind of a dummy object. Well, that's not good enough for us, okay? We want to know what's gonna be in the ground, how big it's gonna be. That's the point of XP drainage in particular. It's showing an as-built level, um, design. 
So I'm going to right click and I'm going to use one of the templates. So right click change templates and I happen to have a pond that I'm going to use. So you know, what happened here? So let's look at what this is now. So here is my pond. We'll see a couple images. I call this a dry pond because we're going to have infiltration underneath it. You know, so within 24 to 48 hours, it will ultimately drain dry. That might be kind of more what this image is showing. Okay. But you get the idea. Everybody really knows what a pond is. But these images do help kind of show what the input would be. So one thing we could start with would be I might I might want to see some increments. Maybe I'll do a, a one foot increments here, and it's going to go one to five. Great. But there's no stage storage relationship. I don't really have this defined. It's just a node. Well, let's change that. So what we can do with XP drainage is we're truly laying out how something will be built. So I might say, okay, free form. Let's add in this nice pond shape. I could also make this a perfect circle. So here's my pond. So what just happened? I, I added the outline. <laughs> Let me do that again. I think I just uh, unselected that. So here's my pond, and what happened? So the software is pretty smart. The software knew, okay, the top elevation, that's what this is showing, the top elevation is this area. Well, it can't automatically give us a stage short relationship for every point in our curve. Okay, well, let's go to our sizing calculator, and I'm just gonna set up a side slope. Now, I'll start with a one to four. Just to see. So, all right, there you go. Now I have a one to four side slope you know, based on how I've drawn this facility. See this? So here, based on this top footprint, I have this stage storage relationship. So a couple things come from this. So we'll see here that we have these areas, these volumes. Now, the software, based on the surface, based on where I've drawn these items, is going to automatically set some items for me. The template I used, all it did, it said this is five feet deep. And that's it. I think it was five feet deep and it had a six inch freeboard. We could get really advanced and we could have maybe a very shallow pond. It's very vegetated. You could say it's got something other than 100% void ratio. Um, we can get into advanced items. We actually should do that. Here's base infiltration. Well, I know that my soil is not that great. So I'll, I can put 0 0.2 inches an hour. I can have that be in the side slope as well. Right? There's the side, there's the batter, and there's the base. I could have the side infiltrate. I'm not going to. We could change all these items. We could designate pollution removal, right? How the different parts of the pond might remove pollution. In this case, we're using a kind of a different approach for that. So something we'll notice here is that the exceedance level I'm going to set this manually. Anything I type in manually turns red. Okay, so whereas the software, no matter where I move the pond, it will automatically, it will sample the surface and then it will set an elevation for me. I'm just going to override that and it shows in red. Okay, let's come back to this in a second. I haven't really sized this other than just drawing, you know, just kind of a general starting point. But this doesn't look real to me. So this is maybe kind of what modeling tools might need to do, right? Where I have, here's a manhole and water drains through this pipe to this node. Well, that's not what we're gonna do with a design tool. We wanna know exactly where the pipe lengths are gonna be, how steep they are. So I can right click and I'm just gonna re-specify some of these inlets. I have a whole bunch here. I'm just gonna, and you'll see what this looks like. I'll re-specify all of them to be real. So here is, in this case, here is where this catchment is going to drain into the pond at this location. Same here. So this is the actual daylight location of that pipe. This pipe is going to drain across the pond, let's say to here. You get the idea. So what we have now is we actually have real lengths of these pipes. So this is the real length, real slope. Here's the pond footprint all in profile. 
And you can see I can interact with it within this profile to look at up and down the system. But by defining where these pipes actually daylight, we now all of a sudden have a, you know, an as build, as built system, you know, once this was to go on the ground. This, this is a construction document layout for our design. And we haven't even begun yet. That, that's really the point of XP drainage, that it gets us here very quickly. Okay, so what are a couple items we might want to work on? So the first might be, let's add some outlets. So I have a volume. We'll give a good smart starting point to this, but I'll add the outlets first. So here I'll go to the outlets tab. And now I'm gonna add two different outlets. So I'll have an orifice and I'll have a weir. And I can give these names, why not? Five year, five year orifice. Um, weir, let's call this high flow. You can give them names. I have a cat named Cooper. You could call these, you know, Cooper one, Cooper two, whatever you want, right? So just so you can understand what these are. Um, let's give these properties. So you see it. Automatically, you're going to set this at the base, the invert of our pond. So I know that I'm going to need to retain and infiltrate the water quality volume. So my pond's five feet deep. Let's just say I want this to be three feet off the base of my pond. So I'll move that to be three feet up. Now the diameter, uh, let's see. I guess um, if you remember, there is... So I'm going to say, I want this orifice to be, really to be engaged about one foot. So if the pond is five feet deep, I'm three feet off the base. I want this orifice to be engaged up to about the four foot zone. Then that's probably where I'll have a weir. So I'll say, all right, design depth one foot. And I know that, you know, there was that five year flow rate. If you remember, I said it was about 2.1. We'll see the diameter of the pipe, you know, 0.97. Well, we're gonna round that to make that be kind of a logical, something, something a little more, uh, not 0.97 something something. So 12 inch diameter pipe, great. Um, I might just, you know, I can do the same approach, use a calculator to figure out the width of the weir. I might just say, to start with, let's just use a three foot width weir. And I wanted that to be four feet off the base. Okay. Great, so here is an, a structure, an outlet structure. I could, if I wanted to, if I needed to, maybe I'll say it like that. We have an outlet. We absolutely could set up unique outfall details for every discharge point on the site. So in this case, there's just one outlet. There's just this one pond. I've worked on sites where there's five different outlets, discharge points around a large system. So for each individual outlet, we can have a different boundary curve. And in fact, you could have a different boundary curve for every rainfall event. Heaven forbid you got to get to that much detail. It's all here. Okay, so we could switch this to be, all right, for each storm, there's a fixed level. We could switch back and forth between, you know, picking the curve so on and so forth, you know, we're not gonna do any of that. I said that we don't need to apply a boundary curve, but just letting you know, it's, it is there. Okay, so here is my outlet. Great. Uh, actually, let's start with our initial sizing. So here is my sizing calculator. I have a couple options. I'll start with a runoff reduction volume. And here's a really, slick way to do it. So I need to retain volume. And this is by far the most common mistake, I would call it, when sizing systems. So if someone's trying to size for a water quality retention volume, and they size that to be stored at the very top of their facility. Well, that's not gonna be retained, right? If my pond's five feet deep, and I say, size it so that it stores water up to five feet, well, my outlet is gonna be engaged at three feet. So we actually aren't gonna retain it. So it's really important, design up to the lowest outlet. So let's take a look here, 0.8 depth. I'm just using the plan data. So everything connected to this pond. So look, 
So here's my target. This is a pretty, pretty common form for water quality volume reporting. What's the inflow volume? What do I have? Am I hitting it or not? And no, I'm not. So let's upsize this facility. So that fits. Great. Oh, and we'll notice how the pond is always locked in plan view in these calculations. So we made the pond big enough for our water quality, you know, it's three feet deep was exactly that number. So our water quality event will fill up based on that calculation uh, to three feet. So let's size it for the 100 year event. Let's see what happens. So I might go, all right, let's go to the software is already looking at all of the directly connected inflow areas. So we've got 13 acres. I know my high flow rate. I've got good memory, right? So 7.12 was the 100 year discharge rate for my existing site. Let's calculate. It's using all of the different rainfall events I have. So it goes from about 1900 cubic feet to about 47,000. What we'll notice here in the software, see this total volume? That's the volume up to the freeboard. You'll notice that the water quality event was actually controlling. The water quality event actually forces this pond to be larger. Um, so in this case, the 100 year event isn't the controlling volume constraint. So let's not apply it because we would just shrink this down and we know we at least need this base volume. Okay. So let's not apply that because our water quality event is controlling. All right, so what did we say? Uh, I said we're gonna start with the right volumes. We're gonna start with some outlet. We have that. Now let's run a full analysis and see what happens. And you know what, I actually, I wanted to whittle down some of the rainfall events. So let me go in here and I still have a lot turned on and I'll just turn off everything so that I'm only running that water quality event. Now, that is kind of a misnomer because per the regulations I have, I need to calculate that based on the, you know, this water quality volume calculation. I also just want to see what an inch of rain does in a full hydraulic analysis. So we're going to look at a full hydraulic analysis of one inch of rain, even though our maybe more conservative 0.8 inch first flush calculation is in there and the five and 100 year events. So great, the first results that pop up uh, looks like this. So we have a summary for our pond. You see it's listed right here. I'm gonna look at all the storms. As one could imagine, you know, the larger the rainfall event, the more full the pond gets. Now we have a couple things to look at. So let's start with the idea that how full is it? You'll see that we're exceeding our freeboard. That's why it says negative one. That means our pond has filled up into our six inch freeboard. That's kind of a kind of a shame on us kind of thing. So let's look at this 100 year event and it just gets into the freeboard zone. We can't have that, but I can also tell that these flow rates really aren't what we want them to be. So yes, we can look at inflow, outflow, what have you. I'm just gonna jump right to that phases report. And let's take a look at what we have here. Let me turn the five year on. So initially we had the existing storm, very, very small runoff event. Well, in our design that we just did, well, there's zero runoff for that event. Well, that's what we we're assuming. Um, that's great. We get into our five year event, about 2.2 is our existing flow. We knock that down a little too far, but our 100 year event isn't whittled down far enough. Okay, so what, what do we wanna do here? What do we wanna change? So a couple things we could do. Let's maybe start with, looks like we need to restrict flow for our 100 year though we're already exceeding the top of the pond. So um, or I guess the freeboard zone. So let's maybe 
I'm not sure if you caught that, but you'll see here, there's this little orange indicator showing that the, the freeboard in this rainfall event is being encroached upon. So we actually are quite close that uh, that runoff reduction volume set this pond to hold maybe some more minor events, but we need to whittle down the high flow. So I guess a couple things we could do, it was over attenuating the, um, it was over attenuating the minor event, but what could we do? So we have a, a weir, I might start with, I'll make this just a little smaller. So I'll restrict the outflow for my high event, okay? Yet I will make the smaller event larger. So try to get water out sooner, then cap it when it gets to the top. That's two things we could do, okay? So we can do that. Um, I might also try to make the pond a little bigger, a little different. So one thing I could do, let's go to side slope again. And you know what? I know that I didn't really follow the bare minimum. So let's do that. So we've gone to one to three side slope, but we'll let water out quicker in the more minor event. Okay. So now let's take a look and run this analysis. We can compare these different phases. It really is unavoidable to have, you know, a couple iterations. Now, in many cases, people spend weeks, uh, you know, playing with different iterations and trying to get things just right. The point here is that we're starting pretty close to what's going to be ideal. And then, you know, we have just a couple pretty nice knobs we can turn like this changing of the slopes and easily setting in and dialing in these volumes, okay? Oh, great, well that seemed to fix some of our issue. Looks like percentage available, we never flood. Uh, looks like we might be over attenuating really across the board. Let's go look at, um, we can look at a couple things here in the moment. I'll show detailed results just for grins. I just wanna look at flow in and flow out. Graphs are great because they show us trends of information. Uh, I really just want to look at the peak results at the moment, right? But you get the idea. Here's results. We could, we could itemize every single time step. Great. Um, even I show in my initial slide on this, we even can show a 3D view of what's happening here. Not that any engineer is going to care. This isn't going to be, you know, on the cover of your report per se. But this is just a way to explain what's happening to someone that's really not an engineer. So all this is going on. Let's look at how our results ultimately compare to our existing site. Well, notice we're getting pretty close. So I can, I'll, let me just whittle this down to be just the five year, 100 year. So five year event, 2.15, wow. Okay, 1.3, we're really over attenuating our minor event and not that far away from our 100 year event. So it looks like our flow rates are pretty good. Remember that the, we only had about 3% left in the 100 year storm, pretty close to the top. So not a lot of wiggle, wiggle room. Um, so if we maybe, let's see here, maybe I could, I can manually set some numbers. So let's say if I, just for grins, I can also show if you wanted to manually type something in. That's my top elevation, right? And I'll set that side slope again based on that top elevation. I can also try, I want to make the weir just a little higher. I'll, I'll go, I'll go kind of 0.2 higher, trying to just massage this to be as exact as we can get. So we were over attenuating slightly, really nothing we can do in the more minor events because of that controlling retention for our water quality event. So that still controls that we're trying to shape the 100 year event to really be as exact as we can get it. I'm glancing over, I see there's some questions you know, I'm, I'm about to wrap up this active design component and I'll dive into questions in a moment. So 
looks like actually zero. We are, are pretty much right on for our 100 year event for the percentage available, right? So we're four and a half feet deep. Let's go to our results and look at that phase report one more time. Wow, so we're, we're over attenuating the minor events, again, out of our control, but the high event, well, I don't think I can get it any closer than that. So that's you know, 7.12 and early 7.1. So that looks like the outflow and the pond storage is as, as dialed as we're going to get it. You see, here we go right to the top with this flow. So we're meeting our flow. We're meeting our volume. Uh, one other item to check would be to go back and to look at, there's a global way to review water quality volume. So here is, here's a kind of a master report for everything. You can see all the different inflow areas that contribute and how this pond breaks down. There's no filter zone, so on and so forth. We'll notice that about 31,559 is our target, and we meet that. So I would print this report. I'm meeting my runoff reduction, my water quality. I am also, as we were just looking at, meeting the different flow rates and volumes for the higher events. Um, I can also look at this maybe easier in a, a basically Excel. So if we have Excel in the software, that's how I like to think of it. Call it tables. Uh, <laughs> very mysterious name. It's just tables, right? So input data and results kind of side by side. So this would be how I would begin to export this and report this information. You know, ultimately the main item that I, at this point, now that I've dialed in this pond to be you know, really the right size for this project, I would export. Um, I could export this project to CAD. I can export out the land XML. So land XML would be the 3D pipe network of all these pipes. I can even plot this long section. So you see, I can plot this to CAD, um, or like literally print it on a printer, um, or also plot it to CAD. And so let me jump. So I already have this open just for the sake of time. So here is, I'm using Civil 3D. This could be any CAD tool. To be honest, this could be GIS. We're going to very readily export information to GIS. And this is really the missing piece for a lot of engineers. So XP Drainage isn't a black box. It's not doing this design in Excel and having someone recreate all of your work somewhere else. Well, you're done, right? Isn't this the pond that we had just designed? So here's the top footprint, top elevation, bottom elevation, side slope. Here's the pipes. Here's the actual 3D pipe. And if you look over here, if you can read it on your screen, you know this is the 3D pipe information. You could move this around and re-import it to XP Drainage, and it would update XP Drainage based on you know, this civil 3D pipe network. But from here, someone can grade the pond, can incorporate this into the rest of their design, really instantly. And that ultimately is really the point of the stormwater part of the project. Not to be the mysterious black box team, it's to get the job done efficiently and push that out um, to the rest of the group. Thanks everyone for the questions. Thanks everyone for hanging on. Um, yes, there are some good ones here. So first, let me just jump right to, I guess a, a couple quick ones. Um, so two things. So one, do we need to define our own parts list um, in Civil 3D to import the land XML properly? So for those of you who aren't familiar with how Civil 3D in particular works, so the idea of the land XML file and importing items, you're going to want the land XML file that XP Drainage makes. It's going to you know have that list in the land XML file. It's it's a complete file. Now really the, the work to be done is on the civil 3D side. There has to be some parts list. Let me actually just jump, right? So you see here, if I go to 
import something, basically this is talking about these dimensions. Hey, there's an inner diameter of a pipe 24 inches. It's very quick, um, just because we're kind of running to the end of the webinar. Um, if you have questions, th that's a really common item. Ultimately, most groups have a parts list that has, you know, 12 inch, 18 inch, you know, every six inches. That's really all that's needed, right? You import that um, from XP drainage, and when you import, that's literally just insert land XML. Let me just select one here. So for grins, I'll show you, hey, well, you can edit these settings and here's the pipe network. And you can just make sure that the pipe network that you're using, uh, let's say these are concrete pipes, um, you know, let's say that these are, you know, I guess the ones you want. Okay, so you can set these up, so on and so forth. Um, you come in here and look at your standard parts list. And I could edit this item. You get the idea. So if anyone's familiar with Civil 3, this is probably pretty common for you. Concrete pipe, you see that there needs to be, you know, the the usual suspects in there. So that's pretty quick. And that's usually something that's kind of inherently already set up for most groups, Civil 3D and really microstation work. They have a standard. And that part list is probably going to be included in the standard uh, unless you're starting from complete total scratch on a uh, project. Um, so a couple other items, questions came through. Can XP Drainage do water quality modeling? Um, yeah, absolutely. We can look at water quality. A couple of things we can do. I didn't get into hydro modification. If that's something you're interested in, you know, that's looking at, well, hydro modification, that is really change over a long period of time. XP Drainage is absolutely going to be looking at pollution generation, pollution concentrations. Um, there are some really, really specialized tools and really like local, regionally specific to look at hydro modification. So depending on where you're at, sometimes there might be some magical spreadsheet. And I'm, I'm being quite serious that there might be a spreadsheet that does this. And that's the way that that county likes things done. So if you're running into some problems, um, if you want to talk about it, that that's a great one to kind of talk in and of itself. I think we've even had webinars on that kind of topic before, but again, my name is Zach. I talk about this kind of stuff all day long. So that's a, a good one. If it is kind of a head scratcher, we can absolutely assess water quality directly in the software. Um, if you have something maybe atypical or something you don't understand, yeah, bring it up. We can talk. Um, another one I wanted to get to is that there's, uh, someone has mentioned that a lot of the developments they're looking at use underground structures. And yes, absolutely, that is uh, actually super, super common to use underground facilities. So I can show that here. So there's a whole range of templates, just like there's rainfall templates. I happen to be using a, a residential developed um, land use template here. There's all these different, I'm gonna call them stormwater controls. Basically everything that you could have someone build in the real world is in here. Swales, ponds, infiltration trenches, rain gardens, um, dry wells. We call them soakaways in the software. You get the idea. Slotted drains. So what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to load up just our tutorial. Um, and I'll just show this is looking at underground storage uh, chambers or pipes or whatnot. So just like I have this pond here, you'll see that here is, and this is literally one of the tutorials on how to get people started with the software. Here's a commercial site. I've used this in webinars before. Commercial site and well, we probably need underground detention. Well, that's easy. So here is the same kind of item that we are looking at now, or that we looked at as the pond. So here, we don't have manufacturer lists, catalogs, baked, hard baked into the software. And actually, you know, again, let's say last week I was really interested to do that. Uh, and, you know, now I'm not. So speaking with municipalities quite frequently, the most common problem with those, with that idea is that 
um, the engineers spec something out in some sort of software tool that has catalogs baked into it, then it gets reviewed and accepted by the city. Then the contractor goes to buy it and that doesn't exist anymore. Or that facility, the chamber, it, it is modified, it, it's manufactured differently. So it's not literally the one that was specced. That is, that is just a, a mess. Um, and so by, you know, obviously finding the catalog, which is current, in a lot of cases, those catalogs do change. And if some software tool has a catalog baked in, that might be from 15 years ago. And that's not good. You know, that, that, that would be, you know, who knows? So that, that's kind of the engineering stamp is at risk there, right? You're certifying work that can't, can't be made. So that's, you know, that's my mindset at the moment. Um, I'd like to make it better. Uh, but really, we can specify any thing in the world here. We can look at, you know, embedded above and below the, the storage. In XP Drainage, we're literally going to assess flow between filter layers and along filter zones. It's not just like a, a bathtub. It's not just an effective storage area like a modeling tool. XP Drainage is very specifically set up to dynamically assess the hydraulics through each filter zone and out the different structures. And it's very, very realistic. In fact, more realistic than, I guess, the standard swim, EPA swim engine tries to handle this. EPA swim doesn't really handle green infrastructure as a hydraulic item at all. It's a, it's a runoff abstraction. So this is a very direct way to assess this. And you can see here, like everything else in the software, you know, on the fly, we can make changes. You know, we're gonna make sure you can only specify full piece of pipe. We're not gonna say eight and a half uh, chambers unless you want to rip one in, in the middle on site. Um, so you get the idea. So yes, absolutely underground systems are quite common. We've talked about that a bit uh, in other webinars. Comment about significant um, figures displayed. Yeah, you, we can change that. Um, you know, often XP tables in particular, something I use for final reporting. I was showing reports with kind of full precision just because that's kind of inherently sometimes how I want to look at it. But you can customize a lot of items in the software with that regard. So the graphs I showed, the comparisons I showed, they aren't the only things you can look at. I think that's all the questions which weren't already answered. Thanks everyone for joining today. Really appreciate your time. Hopefully this was educational. Hopefully it was fun. Um, any questions, again, my name is Zach Sample. We have a whole team of people like me, and this is what we do. So go ahead and contact us, reach out. We're happy to talk. Okay, thanks everyone. Bye.